want to welcome you to church this morning. We're glad that you're here. As you do come in, uh, do make your way uh, to a seat. We don't have the family names on the seat, but we do ask, uh, if at all possible, that you sit still with your family uh, group and, and not uh, without your family group, uh, especially with what's going on recently in our area. And so let's try to do that as best we can. And we look forward to that. Now, a couple of announcements just as we get started. Um, uh, Brother, Brother Longman just shared with me that the test results came back and everything's okay. Um, and so they just have one some medicine and some things of that nature for the moment. And so that's, thank you for praying is what he wanted to let you know. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, do continue to be in prayer for um, Sister Rose. Uh, she's home, right? Is that, yeah, she's home. Uh, but still in a bit of pain, still you know recovering, uh, still has some things going on. So let's just keep praying for her as she continues to recover. Uh, but like we've said before, there's nothing quite like being at home in your own bed with your family. Um, that that kind of helps you out a little bit. So let's be in prayer for her. And uh, those are some things that are going on. So let's go to word and word of prayer. And then we'll get started with the service. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time that you've given us once again to come together. Uh, we we'll pray for each and every person that's here. We thank you for them. We we'll pray for those who, for whatever reason, aren't able to be here this morning. We we'll pray that you continue to be with them. Lord, those who have been away for a bit, we pray that you bring them back. And Lord, let's pray that we have the service this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> The first song we're going to sing this morning is it's entitled Springs of Living Water. We will sing all three verses. May you all stand and we will sing uh, Springs of Living Water. Savior like a shepherd. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
This time we do have our children's story time, and uh, so uh, also if you do have children, if they're four and under in a few moments, right before the message, we'll dismiss you, and then uh, you can go next door, and they have a children's church service for you during the message, um, but other children that are older than that that would like to, on the welcome table, there's a children's sermon notes page um, that has different activities to do that have to do with the service and all that, you're welcome to. Uh, use one of those if when you're done with that at the end of the service you want to come see me and uh, you show me your completed children's sermon notes I have a prize for you and uh, so we look forward to that now uh, we've been talking about the children of Israel now right before we do the children's Bible story let me just make one announcement and you're going to look at me really weird and say how does this relate to the children's Bible story time and I'll tell you in a moment all right Remember, ladies, in a couple of weeks is the ladies' retreat. There is still time if you would like to go, right? We still have plenty of beds. I mean, our beds have beds, and then the beds have beds. So if you'd like to come, we have plenty of space for you. Um, and if you say, well, I, I can't get off work for the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, but you can just get off work for the Wednesday, uh, you're welcome to come up just for the day. Um, we do have to know if you're coming up just for the day because that does involve meals uh, that uh, Brother Pete and I will be preparing for the ladies. And uh, we would love to have enough food for you if you're coming on Wednesday. And so do let us know. We'll make all those arrangements for you. But you say, now what does a ladies retreat and the children's Bible story have anything to do with each other? Well, between this Sunday and next Sunday, ladies, if you listen closely, you may get an answer to a Bible trivia question that may or may not appear sometime during your ladies' retreat. All right? Being, giving a hint without giving a hint. So just listen. and You may or may not be able to answer a question at the ladies' retreat that you might not have been able to answer had you not been at church for a children's Bible story. Okay? Now... Uh, Moses, we said, the plagues had just happened and they were just done and they sent them away. And um, the word of God says that as the children of Israel left, God told Moses that by night he would lead them by a pillar of fire and by day by a pillar of clouds. And so wherever the fire went or wherever the clouds went, they were to follow. And so they were going and they got to a body of water. Now, how many of you realize the Red Sea is a pretty big place, right? Red Sea is a pretty big place. Well, uh, the reason why it was interesting is because you know how Pharaoh kept changing his mind saying, you can go, no, you can't go, you can go, no, you can't go. Even after all the firstborn died, he changed his mind again. And he gathered his army together, he gathered the chariots, and he went after the children of Israel to go recapture them, bring them back in as slaves in Egypt. And so off they had gone in the chariots, and they were going to go get them. Now, as they were going, this one unusual thing happened, right? This pillar of fire came, and they, they were there, and they're at the Red Sea. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if you're standing at a big body of water and you've got an army behind you with chariots coming after you, would you be a little bit scared? So do we now understand why the children of Israel might have been a little bit scared? Well, Moses prayed and God said, well, I'm going to work. He said, tell them not to fear. Now, can you imagine being poor Moses? Having to turn around and say, God told me to tell you, do not be afraid. He is going to work. It's, how many of you at times when you know that God is real and you know that God is working, life still sometimes scares you? Been there? Okay, so we, we're feeling the same thing as they were feeling this day. And here's what he was told. He was told that the Red Sea would part. And sure enough, God parted the Red Sea and the children of Israel all walked across on dry ground. All the way across, they got to the other side and God told Moses to hold his hands back up. Well, about this time when they got to the other side, the, um, the Egyptians thought, well, whatever they can do, we can do, right? If they walked across on dry ground, it's still dry ground. Egyptians get in there and then whoosh, the water comes down and the entire army is taken out like that. Can you imagine how quickly that would be? Now, on the other side, the Bible says that the children of Israel all sang praises. Now, I don't believe that they were happy that all these people died, but I believe the praises they were singing was to their God for delivering them. Now, I don't know about you, but if you read uh, 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 things in the world today, there are some people that are skeptical of the Bible. And they say, well, you know, there's the Red Sea, but at the top of the Red Sea, there's something called the Reed Sea. And the Reed Sea is really a swampy marshland that's no more than ankle deep. So the children of Israel didn't cross the Red Sea. They crossed the Reed Sea, and that's how they got across. If that's true, that's a bigger miracle. An entire army and soldiers drowned in ankle deep water. All they had to do was stand up. Yeah, see, it's a bigger miracle. Why don't we just believe what the Bible says and let God be God? And then uh, next week, we're going to learn what happens. Remember, as the children of Israel were leaving, the Egyptians were handing them gold, right? Remember that story? You will find out what happens with the gold, and it's not a good thing. We'll learn that next week. And so if you want to find out what happens with the gold, you want to find out what happens... After about, you know, 30 days of them going in the wilderness, they have a major event take place and God does something really special in their lives. And while God is doing something really special, they do something really dumb. Yeah, God's working and they be humans, or all that we are. And we're going to see what happens. And then you might, if you pay attention, hear an answer that might help you. All right? So, at this time, uh, Brother Dieter, if you would come, and uh, we'll continue with the service this morning. Good morning, everyone. Just a warm welcome to our visitors. And if you are visiting with us, please uh, make sure that you scan or that you fill in with this car. That will help us. And then also just a reminder that the offering boxes are in the back. Uh, table if you need them, and then Brian, if you can come up and do the Bible reading for us, and that's in First Corinthians chapter nine. Thank you. Okay, this morning we're in um, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, 
chapter 9, near the end of chapter 9. So the final Corinthians, go to chapter 9, then go to verse 24, you'll be at the same place I'm at. And what we're doing, we're reading from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, we're going from 24 to the end of the chapter, which is uh, verse 27. Now, know ye not that they which run the race, no, it doesn't say that at all, does it? Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep my under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The last song before the message we're going to sing is Jesus all over the world. We'll sing all for us.
Take your Bibles, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, those who are going to Children's Church will be dismissed at this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, we've been in a series of messages called uh, a, a Solid Foundation about establishing a solid foundation in our life and in our walk with God. So that way, when difficulties of life come, uh, we will not have what we built our life upon to crumble. Now these foundations are not really glamorous. They're not really uh, seen by people. Uh, but they're really just simply things that a lot of times only you and God know whether or not you're really developing them or not. And uh, so I would just encourage you as we continue, we have a couple more left that we're going to be looking at. And now, uh, this one this morning is probably not a real popular one, and I guarantee you as we define it and talk about it, uh, I'll try to present it in a biblical way, but not in a way that we may commonly think of it. And that is this idea of spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline. Living a spiritually disciplined life. Now, as we were looking at this passage of Scripture, Brother Brian read it, I, I hope you caught on to the idea that Paul is talking to these believers in Corinth, and he's using an analogy of the Christian life with a race. Now, all the time throughout the Bible, Paul uses a lot of sporting illustrations uh, in his preaching. Now, especially in Corinth, Corinth, if you know our modern day Olympics, came from the old Greek Olympics, correct? We, we, we see that they've all developed out of there. Well, Corinth was one of the big um, heartbeds of the Olympics. And so they, were, they knew their, their boxing, they knew about their running, uh, they knew all those types of things. And so what Paul is doing is he's using uh, something they're very familiar with, something they've seen many, many times, to tie it together and illustrate something that no one sees but them and God, and that's the spiritual uh, disciplines. And they understood, these people understood the discipline of an athlete. Now, if you've never played a sport, you may not understand this, but it takes discipline to play sports. We look at these people playing sports on, on television or, you know, you go to attend a game and we think, oh, wow. I mean, how many of you ever thought, wow, these grown men are getting paid to play a child's game? You think about that? But they take a lot of dedication uh, to their craft. They take a lot of dedication uh, to being in condition to be able to play. Now, as Christians... We have a race, according to the Bible, that's set before us. So if you're here today, and uh, not that the fact that you attend church will make you Christian, but you've placed your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone as your personal Savior, uh, you have entered a race. Now, the nice thing about this race is you're not in competition against everyone else here. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, we're all running a race. And we all must endure, to the, we, we must you know, have endurance and discipline and all those other things, but we can encourage one another. To the Christian who wants to finish this race well, we must develop some disciplines in our life. Now, this passage of Scripture, I believe, gives us three very, very important disciplines to develop in our lives. The very first thing is the purpose of discipline. Look at verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one received the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Now, un uh, contrary to popular beliefs in the world in which we live today, everyone who enters a sporting event does not get a trophy. You know, a lot of sporting events, 
You know, everyone, there's a trophy, participation trophy. No, no, there's winners and there's losers. There's someone who won the prize and everybody else who wanted to win the prize but didn't quite make it, right? And that should give you motivation the next time you run to, to do better and win the prize and all those types of things. And so he, he's saying, you run that you can obtain this prize. You see, the purpose of discipline, a purpose is an intention. Our purpose is what drives us to make the choices we make. Your life is shaped by your purpose. What's your purpose in life? Well, that will drive and change and shape a lot of what you do. For example, if your purpose in life is to be wealthy, that'll change the choices you make. You'll work hard. You will, um, you know, do all your research and study about investing and and what's good investments and what's bad investments. And and you 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 will work extra hours and you'll take up all these extra jobs. If that is your purpose, is that now? Also, what if your purpose is to become a good musician at a specific instrument? Do you just wake up one day? I mean, do you, do you go to bed one day, wake up the next day, say, I am going to be a concert pianist. Sit down at a piano and you play, you know, Beethoven symphonies. You know? Is that how it works? Wouldn't that be nice if you just wake up one day and say, hey, tomorrow, tonight I go to bed and I wake up and I decide, I shall be a pianist tomorrow. And I go and I start playing. And so I tell you before we leave church, say, next Sunday I will be the church pianist. First of all, I think we'd have a bigger crowd because everyone would want to be here just to see that happen. Because you all are probably in for a good laugh. All right? Uh, I might be able to play topics, maybe, one handed. You know, that, that's about it. All right? Uh, there's one other one I can play, but you cannot sing to that one. And that's. that's, that's about it, you know, really? Um, and, and what happened? You say, why? If you want to become a concert pianist, you must purpose to invest hours upon hours upon hours of practice. You must take lessons. You must learn your scales. You must learn your theory. Hey, here's a good thing you must learn. You ready for this one? What note every key is on the keyboard. I can sort of tell you what they are, but not. Hey, you know what you have to do? You have to be able to probably, if you cannot play by ear, you probably should be able to read music, right? I mean, you know, for the most part, you know, you should be able to read music. I look at that, and, and if you give me a long time, I can probably tell you what each note is somewhat, but not fast enough to process and do that, okay? But you have to purpose yourself in something. You have to invest yourself in something. Can I tell you, there is a God-given purpose for spiritual discipline in your, in your life as well. But contrary to proper belief, spiritual discipline does not make you more acceptable in God's eyes. And I want to say that this morning. Because there are people out there who will teach, well, the, uh, you have to live a disciplined life, and you should be reading your Bible every day, and you should be praying every day, and you should be, and you should be, and by the way, you should be reading your Bible every day. By the way, you should be praying every day. By the way, you should be attending church, and, and you should be giving, and you should be all these other disciplines, right? But not one of them makes you more acceptable in God's eyes. They don't. See what you mean. What makes you acceptable in God's eyes, are you in Christ or not? And if I am in Christ, then out of a heart of love and obedience for what he's done for me, that's why I get in my Bible. You say, why? Because if someone is going to do that for me and take my place on a cross, I want to know him better. If someone is going to put my sin on him and his righteousness on me, if someone's going to give me that good of a deal in life, I kind of want to know a little bit about it. And I better study this. And you know what? I kind of want to talk to him. So that's why I pray. And I really want to obey him, so that's why I attend church. Because the Bible's very clear, we should. And you say, that's why, that's why you give, and that's why you, yeah, it's all that. But it's not to be accepted by God more. 
There is, however, a purpose for implementing discipline in our lives. Number one, the purpose for implementing difference in your life, you could say, is this, to run the race that's set before you. It takes discipline to run. We need discipline in our lives because we are running a race. Each one of us is in this race, and we only run honorably if we are wise in our discipline. Going back to that sports illustration, I can remember growing up, I played several different sports uh, growing up, and um, every one of them, I used to think our coaches were mean people. I really did say, why? They made me run and run and run. When we played baseball, we had to do laps of the field. When I played basketball, we did laps in the basketball court, and we did suicides where you ran up and down the court and you ran from the baseline to the foul line in the back to the half of the court line in the back to the next free throw line in the back to the full court line in the back and you were in competition and whoever finished last in suicides ran five laps of the gymnasium and then when you were done with those five laps you'd hear line up again and you do it again. And whoever finished last ran five laps before we all caught our breath. And we would do that. You say, oh yeah, you do that two or three times. No, we would do that for like 45 minutes straight. I mean, literally until half the team was standing around rubbish bins puking. And I remember one day someone said, coach, why are we doing this? And he said, because I want you so disciplined in running that when you need it, you, it'll be available. This is what he mean. He said, because with our team, we, we will never have the talent to beat all the teams in our league. But if we can just stay close, we can outrun every team there is. And if we can stay close enough, when they, their lack of discipline kicks in and they can't run anymore, I'll look at you guys and here's all he used to say. He looked at us and he'd go, it's time. And when he said, he would yell in the middle of the gym, it's time, in the middle of the game. Everyone would like look at him like, what does that mean? All of us knew what he meant. And immediately, everything became, we would at full tilt, run it, run it, run it, fast break, run, 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 run. And you would see the other teams go, and we'd win. As long as he said it's time and time enough, and we didn't let them get up too high. You say, why? Because discipline took place. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Here's another way of looking at it. We're foreseeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. Now, this passage again uses the analogy of running a race for a Christian life. In this verse, God gives a glimpse of the activities that are taking place in heaven. You say, well, who's that cloud of witnesses? Well, guess what? Right before that was talking about this cloud of witnesses is Hebrews chapter 11. The hall of fame of faith. All those who've gone before us. They're that cloud of witnesses. They've already finished their race, and now they're cheering those of us who are still running our race. Paul recognized that to press forward in this race meant he would have to implement discipline in his life. The things that used to be meaningful to him, we've been learning in Philippians chapter 2, things that used to be meaningful to Paul, he counted as loss. Why? that he might obtain Christ. Second thing is why, do, what's the purpose of discipline to run the race? The first thing, to obtain the goal. To obtain the goal. Look at chapter 9, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. You see, we need, the purpose of discipline is because we, we need it in order to make the goal of the race. That's to win, to win, to obtain the prize. He's saying how to run. In other words, 
run in such a way as to be able to win your race. There's always a prize to be won at the end of the race. In the Corinthian era, it was a wreath. And this wreath was made of olive branches to be worn on the victor's head. Today, athletes will go after the goal of obtaining a medal or a trophy, right? But to obtain it, the athlete must remain disciplined. If you're here this morning, you know Christ is your Savior. Your goal is Christ. In the Apostle Paul's testimony, we see the goal of our race. The goal for the Christian is Jesus Christ. Though each of us has a different course to run and a different way that we run, we have the same goal, that I may win Christ. Our goal that we may want to obtain is Christ, that we want to obtain is Christ's likeness and the conformity to Him and knowing Him. Second thing we see is the practice of discipline. Look at verse 25. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that leadeth the air. But I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I am preached, uh, when I preach, have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. That phrase, striveth for the mastery, means to enter a contest, to contend with adversaries. It's a choice to participate in this race. Although every Christian is in it, not all Christians continue in it. Many Christians uh, quit because they don't want to practice, uh, to participate in contending against adversaries. The temptation is to transform from being a runner in the race to being a spectator, to watching those who run. To stay in the race, we'll have to practice a steadfast discipline. Our key verse gives us three ways a Christian can implement the practice of discipline. Number one, it says we are to be temperate in all things. That word temperate means to be self-controlled. Now, in an athlete, think about how they prepare for an event. Are they careful what they eat before the event? Do they, you know, they, you know, uh, it uses the analogy of boxing, beating the air. And you think of a boxer who has to be a certain weight class in order to be able to fight. And some boxers who are a little bit too heavy for their weight class have to do whatever they can to take off the weight or they can't be in the fight. They've disqualified themselves just simply why? Because they weren't disciplined and they put on too much weight. You see, that's the analogy that, that he's going at here. There will be temperate in all things. There ought to come a time in a Christian's life when he decides, I want nothing more than the power of God in my life. I want nothing more than the knowledge of Christ, and I'm willing to exercise temperance to gain these things. When Paul said, you know, all things, he, I can, all things, but not all things are good for me. Has anyone realized that? Like, you go to our grocery store. We can eat anything we see, right? If you buy it, you can eat anything we see. But it's not good to eat anything we see. We can go to a buffet. Well, maybe not now, but we used to be able to go to a buffet. Right? And you can eat as much as you want of whatever you want. But is it good to do? What, what if every meal were a buffet? Would that be good? I mean, it's okay every once in a while as a treat. But, you know, can, can you imagine if you ate that way every time? That's not good. You say, why? That's not controlled. That's not temperate. And we've got to be careful. So in, the, in our Christian life, it's the same way. We live in what many refer to as the Laodicean church age from the book of Revelation, where there's a lukewarm spirituality. It's not that they are against spiritual disciplines, but they don't have the desire to develop it personally. The average Christian knows more about sporting events than the message he heard preached last Sunday. The average Christian, I mean, you talk to some, a lot of Christians who are into those other things, and, and I'll be honest with you. Uh, I could, uh, for years and years, I could say all the stats and figures and 
who's won this and who's won that and who's won all that. And you know what? What good is that in eternity? It's not that great. We desperately need a generation of Christians who will love the Word of God, who love spending time with God in prayer, who love the things of God. But to feed that love demands being temperate in all things. We also, the second thing, not just temperate in all things, we need to be purposeful in all things. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. The Apostle Paul was not running his race aimlessly. He had a purpose. There was meaning behind everything he did and every choice he made. You say, what was that? At the end of Paul's life, he wanted to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And in order for that to happen, there's decisions that have to be made all this way before you can pray. And sometimes you've got to make some sacrificial decisions to obtain it. Right? And I, you know, when you, back to the illustration of sports. If you want to become good at a sport, you've got to sacrifice other things. You got to put time in. I can remember the very first year I ever played an organized sport. It was it was sport baseball. Now, I also, I mean, this may shock you, but I was short as a kid. Still am, but I mean, I just hopefully it doesn't shock you too much. But when I first started playing baseball, I was in grade four, and I was barely four foot tall. Like I was, I was small, and I played an entire year of baseball and never once got a hit. Never. You say, why? I walked so many times because I was so small and then you know, when you're small enough and then you do this number, no one could get it between here and here. So I would just walk to first base and I had a ton of stolen bases, but I never got a hit the entire year. And I was determined beyond any shadow of a doubt that between that year and the next year, I was going to hit the baseball. I didn't care where you threw it. I'm going to start swinging at it, and I'm going to hit it, and I'm going to teach myself to hit, and I'm going to become good at hitting. So you know what I did? Drove my mother nuts. We had a big chain link fence right next to our house, and I would go out. And for hours a day, after I was done with my schoolwork, would go, chink, chink, and hit ball after ball after ball after ball into the chain of the chink, 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 chink. And then where I lived, we had winter, and we had snow. I would go out, clear off a spot in the snow, and in the snow, for hours and hours and hours on end. You say, what happened? I actually hit the baseball. <laughs> the next year, I, I was able to get some hits and I was able to do well. I grew a little bit. What happened? You had to invest the time and the discipline. And what did that mean? That meant I had to give up not doing some other things so that way I could stand there. Now, that's really meaningless. You say, why? Because it didn't take me too far, did that? But you still have to invest to become good at something, to be disciplined at something, be purposeful in some things. You see, the purpose for exercising discipline is to give up something so that way you can spend more time on other things. And then we see in verse 27, he says, but I keep under my body and Bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. He says, you know what? You need to be controlled in all things. The phrase, I keep under my body, it's a boxing term. It literally means to buffet one's body as a boxer is beaten black and blue. I don't know if you ever watch boxing much, but they, their bodies get buffeted. That phrase about beating the air, that's, you know, like, have you ever seen someone shadow box? Uh, you know, they get down to the stands and they start boxing at the air. That's the phrase, beating the air. But that, that phrase literally there, um, talking about, I keep under my body's objection, it's literally 
means to buffet one's body. You say, why? Because as a boxer spars, and as a boxer gets hit, uh, I don't know if you ever box, but the first time you box, you almost box timidly and afraid. Most people do. You say, why? Because how many of you think the greatest thing in the world is to think the thought of, I'm going to step in there, and I'm going to put gloves on, another guy's going to put gloves on, and he's going to absolutely try to hit me as hard as he can. That's going to be fun. You know, I mean, you've got to get used to getting hit. Right? That's buffeting the body, you know. It's, and after you get hit enough, it's like, oh, it's not so bad. I don't know if it's, it's not so bad or you just become numb, dumb, or bruised up behind any pattern of the doubt. They don't feel it anymore. But it happens. And you see, what God is teaching us here is that a disciplined life demands that our flesh is brought into subjection and it's controlled and all things. Lastly, we see the prize of discipline. The prize of discipline. Now I'm going to say something. You might look at me for a minute, but let me just explain. The prize of living a spiritually disciplined life is not heaven. It's not. You see, salvation gives us that security. Living a disciplined life has nothing to do with going to heaven. If you're saved, you know Christ is your Savior. You're going to heaven and be with God forever. Discipline or undisciplined, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you have the promise of eternal life. Now, at the end of our race, there's an award ceremony at which we'll be present. Just like at the end of any race. There are prizes to be won. There's crowns to be won. By the way, at the end of your race is something called the judgment seat of Christ. It is at the judgment seat we will be given the prizes of our life's discipline or lack thereof. Look at the destination. Take your Bible and turn me to Romans chapter 14. Verse 10. But why, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. You understand, the destination of every person who ever lives on this earth will be to stand before God. You say, but I don't believe it exists. I guarantee you there are no atheists in that moment. There's no atheist at the end of life. There's no atheist when we have to, when we're called to stand before Christ. We're called to stand before God and called to give an account. The greatest thing, though, is as a believer, when you stand before the University of Christ, uh, you will not be judged uh, on your sins. You will not be judged of whether or not you'll be in Christ. But you will give account for the choices you made and the way you lived your life. And whether or not you accomplish for God what he had you to accomplish. And at the end of that is when you may hear, and Lord willing, you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you'll be given crowns of rewards. We won't go into all of that, but the Bible does talk about several types of crowns you can win. You say, why are you going to get these crowns? You can walk around heaven with multiple crowns on top of your head and say, look how good I am. No, 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 no. The Bible says that we'll cast our crowns back at the feet of Jesus. And worship to him. Because you know what? Without him, none of us can live a spiritually disciplined life. Without him, none of us would be there. The destination. And lastly, we see the declaration. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The wreath that the ancient Greek runners received only lasted until a little bit. 
those all of, you know wreaths. You ever you ever bought a real wreath at Christmas time? Not like one of the artificial ones, but like a proper one. They smell beautiful. They smell of pine. They smell of all kinds of different things. They look beautiful. Wouldn't it be nice if that stayed looking and smelling that way forever? Have you ever bought like a, a husbands? Have you ever <laughs> have you ever bought your wife some nice flowers? I'm not asking the reason why you bought the flowers or what dumb thing you did to necessitate buying the flowers. But have you ever bought them flowers? Never thought for the price I paid for those flowers, they should last longer than they did? You say, why? And I'm not, I mean, you're talking like real living flowers, not like fake artificial plasticky things. You say, what? They're temporary. They fade. But you know what? Our rewards the rewards we receive for running a spiritually disciplined life are eternal rewards. They're crowns that you can cast at the feet of Christ. They're, they're eternal. They last forever. And our greatest desire should be to hear God tell us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. As we conclude this evening, go back to this morning, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we'll read verse 25. Never man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Now the name is seat in Corinth. <coughs> Many athletes receive the rewards for which they labored. By the way, Corinth was the seat of the Bema seat of the Olympic judges. Their prize was a simple wreath. As we said, eventually it wilted. It was a corruptible crown. But the Christian who's building below the baseline, who's setting up a solid foundation, is striving for an eternal reward. The incorruptible crown, which is what we will be able to lay at the feet of Jesus in an act of worship and praise. The Apostle Paul ended his race with the anticipation for meeting the righteous judge. He did not have regrets for the things missed out on his life because of his determination to be temperate in all things. He could depart from his earthly life knowing that he has crowns waiting him in the judgment seat of Christ. Someone once said, the Christian life is not a hundred yard dash, but it's a marathon. If you're here this morning, you know Christ is your Savior. Can I ask you, have you grown weary? Are you exercising spiritual discipline that will keep you in the race? Can I challenge you this morning to determine that you will fight a good fight. You will finish your course. You'll keep the faith. So that way when you stand before Christ, you can get the incorruptible rewards to give back to Him and cast no speak. And so that way you too may be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we come before you. Lord, we thank you so much for this challenge from, from Paul and from uh, this life of discipline, uh, this life of determining, Lord, to live for you and to give our lives to you. Lord, we thank you so much for the example of Paul. Lord, we also pray that there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, and they not leave today without getting that settled. They, may they want to know how they can know for sure that they have a home with you forever. Lord, I pray now that as we're about to leave, as we're about to go from this place, they be with us, give us safety, bring us back safety this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I thank you once again for coming out this evening. We'll end a little bit, a little bit differently. We'll adjust a little bit this morning. And uh, If you have a question, if there's any way that I can be a help to you, I'll be available immediately after the service in the back. 
Uh, again, if you're here today, you're a Christ receiver. We'd love to be able to show you that from the Bible. If there's something else that you need help with, prayer for, let us know. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back tonight, 5 o'clock. We have our evening service. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And again, children, if you do have your sermon notes, please see me. And uh, we'll discuss those and we'll get your prize. And we look forward to seeing you back this evening.